what I'm going to talk quite briefly and at a very high level about today is how and whether the tools to measure impact can be made to be simple enough and flexible enough to be deployed on developer-funded projects. And by doing that, where's the advance button? Uh, that one. To encourage uh, the planning for an achievement of meaningful impact. And it's that dreadful saying of what gets measured get ma gets managed. So if we actually have impact measurement in our, in our project designs and things, will we actually end up doing more of it? Also, hopefully, to create an evidence base to convince ourselves and our clients that delivering an impact is a safe, joyful, beneficial activity which actually speaks to their aims and uh, corporate social responsibility as, as well. And also to help us to do better, cost-effective projects that re actually reach an audience beyond the team that, that does the work. Now, I have to confess that I am a, a novice in evaluating impact. and I'm aware that there are whole conferences on I impact evaluation, measuring impact, um, people do PhDs on it and everything. So uh, what are, apologies if I say the obvious or I say the wrong thing. Um, but I do care passionately um, about the importance of sharing the creation of archaeological knowledge and using the activities and skills required for archaeological investigation to benefit society, whether that's through training, participation, volunteering, research, or simply communicating. And just to, to uh, break up the, the succession of, of wordy slides I've got, um, this is a picture of a project which I love. Um, it's actually quite an old project now. Um, it was the archaeological evaluation of a park in, along Whitechapel um, High Street. It's called Alta Valley Park. It's the site of the original Whitechapel. And um, it could have just been a simple um, archaeological evaluation because some, uh, the, 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 the council, in, as part of the Olympics, tidying up Whitechapel High Street, the High, High Street Londinium and the Olympics, they, they needed to tidy up the park. And to do that, they appointed some architects, to, um, uh, to, to, to design the landscaping for, for, the, for, the, for the Tidy Up Park. And we needed to do some trenches to see where, whether any remains of the original medieval Whitechapel or the later Victorian um, church actually survived on the site. In, instead of just being a simple evaluation, it, it, was, it was made into an incredible collaborative project um, with uh, consult, consultation with the local businesses, local stakeholders, the people who regularly sat in the park. And the architects were very, very creative. They actually a firm of architects, bizarrely called Muff, um, who, uh, who, who are great. They're, they're, they're an artist arch architect, architect practice. So they have an artist resident working with them in, in, in their sort of director's team. <coughs> Sorry. And they decided to turn the park into a, a, a museum and got the locals to label up all the artefacts in, in, in the park, i.e. the trees, the benches, they asked us if we could allow the local community to actually excavate in the trenches. We had a drop-in evaluation trench that people could come in and, and dig. And um, we also had a, a wonderful uh, thing which, which we did with uh, the, the architects as well, was an artefact exchange where people came in and dropped off an artefact of their own, something in their pockets, wrote a label about what it meant to them, um, which, was, which was actually very, very powerful and moving. And in return, they got a cupcake or something. And then we arranged all these things. And lo all sorts of things went on. It was, it was a wonderful um, project and an example, and I'm sure there are many going to be heard in this conference, many examples like this of uh, really impactful um, uh, work happening on, on quite simple projects. Now, we do evaluate impact at, at MOLA, um, so we, on all engagement, training and school projects, um, we have some form of measurement and evaluation of, of how well we've done against our original objectives. But this is not standardised, and it does re respond to project requirements, and I don't think that's necessarily a problem. And there are major grant-funded projects, like we're going to hear about later, the uh, TDP, Tense Discovery Programme, and citizen, where there are where there are very strict and, and very clear requirements for measuring um, our effectiveness and impact against our original objectives, and quite often we we have to employ external consultants to help us to evaluate those projects. But I would say on our medium and large developer-funded projects, probably excluding infrastructure, 
They are evaluated by our organisation on financial performance, first and foremost. Are we, going to, are we going to lose money on it? How staff have done? Have they done the right thing? When we get to the publications, we will take note of the external reviews of our books and articles, and we will monitor the reach of our communications, but we don't monitor impact. We don't actually have a way of... Well, we haven't um, put the effort probably in to looking at how we can actually monitor it, monitor the impact, identify the impact and monitor it. Now, it, as I said, there's, there's, there's a whole world of, 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 of scholarly uh, information about how to measure impact. One thing that comes clear is there is no set formula for impact evaluation in each project needs to be considered individually. And what we need are frameworks that help us to ask the right questions. And I've just grabbed some. This one is, uh, you know, four points are from the University of Leicester, um, which are probably targeted much more towards research. And it's, you know, the first stage is to understand and just describe the baseline situation you're in. What is, what is the environment you're working in and what are the impact objectives? Then develop those evaluation questions. This is all right at the start of the project based on the above. Identify appropriate quantitative and qualitative data collection methods, and either one on its own is not going to be good. And then report on the results and, of course, learn from them. That's one, one model. Um, I know the Arts Council has another where they actually sort of triangulate in how effective they think the projects they're funding have been. And the way they do that is to get feedback from their own staff, how well do they think it's gone, from the peers in other organisations that might be relevant and from the beneficiaries of, of the project itself. So there are many, many different ways of looking at impact. But I think for us to actually make it happen, we need something simple, realistic and flexible enough to respond to the different circumstances and variables of an archaeological project. And my question this morning, which um, I have to confess I, I cannot quite answer, is, is the theory of change the right model? How many people have come across theory of change or have know it? Know it? Okay, reasonable spattering. Oh, that, that's, that's good. <laughs> but it's also, yes, it's good that quite a lot of people don't know. <laughs> so um, theory of change. Uh, as I say, I'm not an expert on this, but it is a specific type of methodology and it's um, for planning, participation and evaluation used particularly in the philanthropy, not-for-profit and government sectors to promote social change. And as Helen said, it defines, identifies long-term goals and then you work backwards, or in some models you work backwards to identify the actions and the stages you need to go through. That's one definition. One of the um, original uh, sort of uh, conceivers of, of theory of change which, which grew out of a, uh, a sort of community initiative in, in Aspen, in Colorado, in the mid-1990s, where they were trying to evaluate the impact of, or work out how to evaluate the impact of very complex community projects. And this woman, Carol Weiss, um, said, you know, quite simply, you need to lay out the sequence of outcomes that are expected to occur as a result of an intervention, and then plan your evaluation strategy around tracking whether these expected outcomes are actually produced. Still, it can sound quite confusing. There's a very helpful um, organisation called New Philanthropy Capital, and they have uh, a book on how to create your own theory of change. And they reassuringly say it's actually a very simple concept. Um, I won't go through and read everything here, but you know, we, we in our lives have goals. But it's, it's very true. We rarely think, spend the time to think about, you know, how am I going to get to the point where I can move house or whatever. What are the stages you need to go through? And so an all the theory of change process does is to make some, you know, to, to articulate the stages, make the assumptions explicit and therefore testable. So boil down, this is my simple um, explanation of what I think theory of change is. You have to identify your long-term goal. <coughs> Sorry. Work out the conditions that need to be in place for us to reach that goal. And then there's... It's very archaeological and satisfactorily like a matrix, actually. You need to get the causal sequence right of the actions and then the outcomes and then write a story about that with the assumptions and the rationale. And then put in the indicators to measure change. And this thing needs to be rooted in the real world with all its complexity, or as much complexity as the thing can stand, um, 
incorporating different viewpoints, and very, very importantly, and I think this is something that Helen will talk about later, it's very important to not do this in a top-down way, but to involve the interested parties, and that, again, will help build a, build a better project. So there are, if you Google theory of change and you ask select image, it can be bewildering because there are things that look like the most complicated wiring diagrams in the world. Um, but it doesn't have to be. There is no set template for these things, and they can be quite simple. This is something called, I learnt, the CES planning triangle, and that's the... I forgot what CES stands for now, but never mind. Um, this is a very simple one, and you start at the bottom. Apologies, it's probably not that clear. You start at the bottom with the activities. Uh, this, this particular one is about setting up a social housing... Uh, supported housing um, situ situation so uh, for, for, for past offenders. Um, so there are activities set out at the bottom, there are the intermediate outcomes, and then the ultimate goal, which is quite neat with a triangle because you, the, the, the trouble with these things is goals can become flabby and multiple, and it's good to keep them, keep them focused. Um, so here we have, uh, in this model, um, independent lives. And I think for the main difference to me to other ways of looking at how we're going to get from here to there with theory of change is that it recognises that there can be many different um, inter intermediate stages and steps which are all valuable and also, very importantly, necessary to get to your ultimate goal. You're not going to get from here to there straight away. And here is, here is a more complicated one. Again, um, it's for a supported housing project. Um, it's more complicated, but it's not as complicated as some. And uh, the purple box represents the long-term goal, which there is, is quite ambitious. It's reduction in criminal behaviour. And quite often these models have a dotted line around them, which is um, called the accountability line. And that means, um, it, you know, it is beyond the scope of your, your, your project to deliver all of this, but you are contributing to it. So the ultimate aim is reduction in criminal behaviour. All the yellow boxes are the intermediate outcomes. The orange are the enabling factors and the reds are the activities. Um, I don't expect to, to read it all, but it, has, it definitely has a call, it causal flow through. And whoever has put this together has gone through and identified and worked with you know, their key stakeholders and things to identify these, these, these different stages. There are many, um, <laughs> as I say, if you go on the internet, there are many, many different versions of these. But Nesta, um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Nesta. It's the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts. Got it right. Um, have a lot of very, very useful um, toolkits for these these sort of um, things, for helping to structure your thinking. And and this is this is uh, one of them, which I'll show um, another version of in a minute. And there are very important. Um, stages to go through when and evaluating your, your, your theory of change. Is it, is it going to be meaningful? Is it well-defined? Uh, is it comprehensible? Can you give a sort of elevator pitch, 15 seconds or two minute story about it? And, and very importantly, are the, is it doable? Is it plausible? Is it realistic? Is it credible and testable? So going back to our developer uh, funded archeological projects, is it, is it actually going to be possible to use a theory of change model on this when there's not much lead-in time and the procurement routes are not always favourable to us planning, as archaeological contractors certainly, to planning something as, as wonderful yeah. as this? Also, we have non-disclosure agreements that we have to sign to... Um, so how can we consult with stakeholders and make it a genuinely consultative activity? Um, it's not going to be the client's focus at the start. They've, they've got to build something, and that is, the, that is the thing that has to happen. And that's quite right that that's the thing that has to happen. And also, we don't always know what's going to come down the line at us in terms of the amount of work, how it's sequenced, um, and what we're going to find, how, 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 how useful is it going to be. And the length of projects may not be very conducive, but I think on larger schemes and infrastructure projects, yes, we absolutely should be looking at um, theory of change models and... This is just a picture from uh, Greystone recording on HS2, and I think that I think there are lots of uh, the, the, the forthcoming stages of HS2 where this would be interesting to, to to try this out. And I think a theory of change is very good, and where where it can 
work to encapsulate not perhaps the individual projects, but the approach that we take to all of our developer-funded projects as, as um, archaeological contractors and, and others associated with it, is to look at, look at it as a framework for achieving our organisational or sector goals. Now, this is, this is, this is a, a, an attempt that we put together quite quickly um, of looking at uh, using the, the Nesta template, um, identifying a problem, you know, for example, MOLA needs to work harder to benefit society, and our goal, which is not punchily and pithily um, addressed, is we need um, MOLA projects deliver public benefits. You know, we, we do that. And you can go through the steps, identifying key audiences, en entry points, key actions to affect change, and then the measurable effects and the wider impacts. And it is actually, I can, this is not perfect. And this is not, these are not necessarily the, the actions and the outcomes and the stages that you would go through. But I can see that it would be a very effective and useful model and something that would be very interesting to talk to people during this session this morning about how this could be trialled or taken forward or so. And I'm delighted that it can also be used as a retrospective analytical tool. Um, I'm always going on about the Temple of Mithras and, and Bloomberg. Um, but that is a fantastic example of uh, a, a, a sort of unintended um, example. Uh, we, we were, to go back a stage, we, we did an oral history project um, asking people who queued up in the 1950s to get in touch. And initially it was about, tell us if you've got any good photographs or artefacts that you, you recovered from the site in the 1950s. What people actually told us was what the impact of seeing archaeology just for a few minutes, really, had on the rest of their lives. And um, these theory of change models can be actually used as a, as a sort of retrospective analytical tool. We know what the impact was. These people have told us that there was a very profound impact on their lives. And what were the stages before that? And what, what was it about it um, that, that um, made it so special? Um, so that's certainly something we're, we're, we're going to have a go at. So the plan, and this is where I have to confess, you know, I'm here at least two, if not three years too early, um, because we are going to attempt uh, through a change with colleagues and stakeholders that has the long-term goal of delivering medium, of meaningful impact on medium to large developer-funded projects, and we will be reporting on those results. And I would, uh, if you're, anyone's interested and you want an easy route into this, I recommend the Nesta toolkits and the videos that go with those and new philanthropy capital. Thank you.